Hello, and welcome to the We're Not Stump podcast. I'm your host, Mike Boland, and I'm a congenital amputee of the right hand. In this show, I will interview other amputees and allow them to tell you their incredible life stories. I'll also feature family members of amputees and others who support the amputee community, all in an effort to discuss the challenges and triumphs of those living with limb loss. So stick around and listen to inspirational stories and find out why we say we're not stumped. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the We're Not Stumped podcast. I'm your host, Mike Boland, and today I welcome Danielle Robbins. When her then four-year-old dog, Goose, tore a ligament in her knee, tripping on a tree root while chasing a rabbit, it sparked an aha moment for her. And that aha moment has led to the creation of a business that is helping animals all over the country. And we're going to get into that more today on this episode of the We're Not Stumped podcast. But first of all, Danielle, thank you for taking the time out of your day for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and tell people that this is an option and how it can help the animals and the humans that are with them. Yeah, I can't wait to learn more about this because this is something I really don't know much about. So, I, And I, th- I have a feeling that a lot of listeners don't either. And it's such an important thing. And I, I just love your story. And Thanks. speaking of your story, we always start the podcast with a segment I call In Your Own Words. So I'd love the listeners to learn a little bit more about you. Sure. Um, I grew up in a medical household. I always knew I was going to do something medical related. I didn't want to be a doctor. I always loved movement, though. I grew up as an equestrian, always had dogs. And I found out about orthotics and prosthetics and got a master's degree in that for humans and did that for a long time. And I'm still doing that. Um, But it wasn't until my dog got hurt that I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's this entire other all the other species that also need these solutions. And when I went to look for my own dog, like there was Amazon stuff there were a bunch of bad braces there were a lot of things out there that even i like as a professional had a hard time navigating and it's like oh my gosh like there there needs to be someone that dedicates the same expertise and time and patience and just quality of care for animals so that's what orthopause does we're really excited we see dogs cats goats um working on a bearded dragon and some ducks um (laughs) so really anything with legs so it's a really nice um complimentary part to my human job. Well, I want to get into that. That's a question I always have because people like you do such great work. And I want to get to the human part of it first. For humans, you know, like me as, as a person mm-hmm. in the limb loss community, what what was your inspiration to start making prosthetics? And what you kind of touched on it a little bit. Your whole family was in the medical field. But what made you want to get into prosthetics in general? It's a good question. Um, I joked on my school applications, and I wasn't really joking, but my dad's a doctor and my mom was a sculptor. So when it came to prosthetics, I was kind of like, this is my jam right here. But I didn't find it initially. Um, I actually wanted to be a physical therapist and applied to all those schools and did my thousand hours of shadowing. And in the very last 10 hours, I saw a prosthetist and a physical therapist's office. And I'm like, what is that? Like, I need to do that. I was like, I want to make stuff. I want something that people will wear every day that can help them. If they have problems, they have an advocate. Um, so it was this very nice little off-branch niche for me. Um, and I I really enjoyed it. There's not a lot of people that do what I do, especially for the animal side. But even on the human side, a lot of times I'm going out and educating doctors and speaking to amputees that haven't had great experiences, trying to make things better. So for me, it's just a really meaningful um and creative field, which is what I need. Yeah, and speaking of the humans, I, I definitely, we're going to talk about animals a, a lot. Sure. But when we're talking about the humans, I think a lot of people may get thrust into their own journey for medical or accident reasons. And I think, kind of to your point, the lack of knowledge, which is no problem. If you're not part of the right. limb loss community, you're not going to know. But a lot of people think, hey, Thursday, I have my amputation. Friday, I'll get fitted. By Saturday, I'll have my prosthetic. And that is not the case at all. That is a huge journey in itself. What are some of the things that you think people should know about the prosthetic journey that may be going through it very early? It's a good question. It kind of depends on where you're coming from. If it was from an accident, you're probably going to have a little bit easier of a transition into wearing and successfully using a prosthesis. But there's going to be healing time. We can't make it until you're healed. We have to get you into the right shape. We have to teach you about it. We have to do the fitting. We have to deal with insurance. So a lot of times it's, it's not a, we'll see you tomorrow for your leg. Here you go. We're a vending machine. Um, it's a very, very personalized process. Um, taking insurance out of the equation, even without having to deal with insurance, it's probably 
three weeks, a month, maybe two months, because we're doing all these extra fittings, making sure it's comfortable, trying different feet or hands, um, and making sure that it works for the person, because no one needs the same thing. So a lot of this journey is learning what you need to get back on your feet, no pun intended, and just kind of going from there. So it's a process, but if you find a prosthetist that relates to you and listens to you, you'll have a much better outcome, um, even though it takes a little bit of time. Is that parallel to what you do with animals? That whole journey you were talking about there? Pretty similar. There's no insurance, so it's easier. I'm not going to lie. Um, the difference is these patients can't talk to you. They can't tell you how anything's feeling. I'm really relying on the pet parents to be like, oh, they did this, that, and the other, or this is what's happening, or they've been slowing down due to arthritis for two years. So just managing expectations with that is a big thing as well. So like for my dog, it was one ligament. I knew that if I could help stabilize the knee, she would be back to how she was. That's not the case with all the animals that I see. So a lot of them, since people don't really know about these options, a lot of times until it's like almost their last resort. Um, and we're trying to change that, trying to educate people. So it's not the last resort, but a lot of the animals I see, like they need rehab, they need a lot of stuff too. So they'll get their devices more quickly, but in terms of being able to use it about the same as humans, it takes some training. Um, and some patients and some owners and a lot of treats. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think us humans like those treats too, depending on what you're saying. Maybe a beer and I'll, I'll wear my prosthetic again. <laughs> <laughs> so it, one of the things that I read about you, and I think it was the Tampa Bay Times, am I correct on that? Mm -hmm. excellent, excellent story about you and what you're trying to do with your business. And I'll link to it in the description. But you had talked about a, a pet owner that had a, I believe it was a dog who went through a lot of different devices. I think they tried to do some DIY stuff and they weren't getting anywhere with it. And can you kind of talk about that journey? I'd never even understood or knew that there's something like, like they sell these things on Amazon. What, what is that? Yeah. Like? Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there and I don't think most of it is like malintentioned, but there are some companies out there that just prey on people not knowing, but the, patient that you're referring to in the article, um, the sweet little dog was itty bitty. It was the smallest, like the cast was this big, like the <laughs> whole leg. Wow. Like I have big hands. It's like two little wraps of fiberglass, you know, but they came in and the owner, very sweet man, but he had tried this on his own, the casting on his own. He had tried things from Amazon because on Amazon or online, if you type in dog knee brace, it's going to bring up these things that look like braces, but people don't really know the reasoning what makes a brace work or not work. So this client had, you know, he's trying to help his dog. He doesn't know where to turn. He's doing his research as best he can, but he got something from Amazon and within 20 minutes of her wearing it, it was chafing her in the groin because it's a piece of material and it didn't do what it was supposed to. So he found us, he was like, oh my gosh, thank you. Like, what do I do? We're like, let us help you come on. And they're doing great. You know, like we took care of everything for them. But a lot of what we're trying to do is educate people that a brace is not a brace is a brace. Like there are good braces. There are bad braces. There are inappropriate braces. Um, and that's why we're here really, because vets can do this on their own. Like they can order direct from manufacturers, but I would never put that dog in a different brand, even though I use that other brand for different dogs. Um, so there really is kind of an art and a science to it that people overlook, don't know about, or just think everything's the same. Yeah, a great point. Like a general practitioner for humans wouldn't be fitting me for a prosthetic. And that's kind of what you're saying with the vets. You know, they, that's not their expertise. It's not to say it's right or wrong. It's just not their expertise. Is yeah, that and there's not a, there's very, very few. I think orthopause is maybe one of three. This is a guess. But like very few places are dedicated exclusively to animal mobility devices. Yeah. A lot of vets, especially like rehabilitation veterinarians will work directly with these companies like by a Zoom call. Once they find a brand that they like, they'll say, this is how you do the casting. This is how we do the fitting. But of course those brands, and they're good brands, but of course those brands aren't gonna be like, you would be better suited off with this brand. Or this is not magic. They, they want business. Um, so the vets are relying on that as our only source of information. So another thing that we do is we consult with veterinarians, whether it's here or far away, say, hey, like my dog is missing a limb. What do I do? And X, Y, and Z, let's talk through it. Um, so it, it's a pretty special thing. I'm excited to see how many animals we can help because it's not only the animals. Like I have, I have a patient coming in today 
the pet parent has MS, the dog has degenerative myelopathy, which is almost the equivalent. So the dog's hind legs aren't really working anymore. Um, so for her, like me also being a human clinician, I decided to design the wheelchair so that it's easier for her to get the dog into it because she can't pick him up. So um, the orthopause, this one and all the ones in the future are going to be run by certified process orthodist so that we can make those kind of decisions to not only help the pet, but also the owners. Um, so it's, it's a very multifaceted thing. Um, and we're just kind of at the ground floor of it. Well, I like how you thought through that. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. serious. I mean, that, I, I, th I think that kind of goes to the point where you, you, this is your expertise and that's why you're able to think through it. And you had said something earlier that I, I, I want to make sure I address. You said uh, that the gentleman who owned the dog from that got his stuff on Amazon found you. So for the people that aren't that are just listening and maybe aren't going to read a description, how do people find you? What's your um, URL? You can just go onto our website right now. It's orthopause.vet, like veterinarian. And on there, depending on what you're needing or what you think you need, if you don't know, that's okay. But on the forum, we have a custom orthosis page, a custom prosthesis, and a custom wheelie solution page, um, depending on what's going on. And you can submit the information about your dog, some photos, or your cat, or your goat, or your cow, or whatever. You can submit all of that, and then we'll reach out to you and kind of discuss further options. So that's a very easy process, I think. You go to ortho, orthopause.vet. Yep. Excellent. Yep. Or you can give us a call and we'll speak to you. But a lot of times it's very helpful to have photos um, and videos just because unlike the human realm, usually when I get a diagnosis, it's like leg not working well. Like, why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for humans, you know, drop foot, X, Y, Z. Um, it's... It's a little bit of a barrier there, but once we know what's going on, we can, we can address it. You know, you had talked already about two of your success, success stories. What are some of the other ones that have kind of come into your life and you, you look back on and go, gosh, that was a, that really helped that animal. I love all the bracing we do. A lot of times the bracing we do is a big alternative to surgical procedures. Um, this one shepherd I'm working with right now jumped off of a balcony and pretty much hyperextended both of her wrists. And the options were either fuse the wrist both at the same time for about $14,000 or come in and have some custom braces made that'll take about 10 days and then she doesn't need surgery and she can do that. Um, we haven't delivered that yet, but for the bracing, that's a lot, that's a pretty common story that we get. But it's something that I look back on and we do not make our wheelchairs, we use Eddie's wheels. We trust them. It is all they do. We just facilitate and help design them. Um, but those are really the biggest. We put them in and they run around. I had this little dog, and I will share with you the video if you don't have it. Um, but it, yeah. he was paralyzed from pretty much the shoulders down. He's in a little diaper. He's a little Frenchy. He's two years old. Um, he has a condition called IVDD, intervertebral disc disease. Um, but we put him in his little wheelchair, and he was running around the clinic, like the balls on the table that are decoration, grabbing them, jumping with his front legs. And previously he was dragging his legs on the floor. Um, so like now he can be a dog. Um, and that's really what we want to do. It's not like, oh, wow, your steps per minute have increased. It's like, can you do doggy things? Sweet. Um, so I have goosebumps. Um, yeah. But we have a lot of cases like that. Um, the prosthetics are really pretty life-changing. They take some time to get used to, but I get a lot of update videos. I'm like, oh my gosh, like I saved this dog's other shoulder from giving out and their spine from twisting because like, even though they have three legs, they really need four. Yeah. Um, you know, imagine doing a plank with one arm lifted. That's what they're doing all the time yeah. if they're missing a leg. So the prosthetics for that, though not as immediately cool later on down the line, it's saving a lot of issues and that just, it's good for everyone. Well, just like a human, I mean, like, with me, yeah. overuse injuries can happen. And that's yes. something I have to look out for. I, I didn't even think about it in the animal realm, but oh, the way, yeah. yeah, the way they have to get around, I guess would be even more prevalent. Yeah, like I said, imagine doing a plank and holding up like one arm or leg and that's just how they stand at all times. Yeah, <laughs> And then never the look of their body, it's like, oh my gosh, they're like, they have to be so strong and they get so tired. <laughs> Um, so if we're not making up or even just like an injury, so if they're not even missing a limb, but like they aren't walking on one of their hind limbs because it hurts, they're still essentially a tripod, even though they still have the leg. 
So um, just giving them back that balance and the ability to use all four legs, whether it's varied or not, you know, it's going to save a lot of issues because even in dogs, ACL and dogs is called a CCL. That injury accounts for 85% of the orthopedic surgeries that are done for dogs. Wow. So like it's, it's a lot. So we get a lot of knee braces in here, but the thing that people don't think about is if left untreated, the other side's going to go out within a year. So are you going to do two surgeries? If you can, if you can, awesome. If it's not in your wheelhouse, then a brace. <laughs> like, let's help prevent things before they happen. Um, so that's another big thing that we're trying to teach people about because not every dog is going to need a preventative measure, but rather than spending $8,000 at the vet later on because you didn't address it, but let's put something cute on there and just forget about it, you know? That is excellent information. I didn't even, I wouldn't have thought of something like that. Yeah, if, if, if they have one bad knee, the other one, to your point, is going to probably go out within a, a year. I guess from your experience, it will go out within a year. That would be very expensive. It happens. It happens. And, you know, it's sometimes it's the breed of the dog. It's usually bigger dogs, more ankle dogs like shepherds. It's very rare that you'll see like a greyhound with a mm -hmm. torn ACL just because they're pretty much straight up and down. <laughs> but any of the other ones, like it's usually going to happen to the spayed females like my dog. Um, so we see a lot of that. That's probably never going to change, um, unfortunately, but at least there are options that people can put their dog in and go to the beach and not worry about it. You know, one thing that since I've been talking to you, we had a little pre-conversation before we hit record on the podcast is the passion in your voice for what you do. But there was a time in your life that you were, as you say, you still dabble with the humans, but you were mm -hmm. exclusively more in a human. And then you made the decision to start a business, which when you have passion, everything is rosy and everything looks great. But then as you start to move mm -hmm. forward, there are always challenges starting a yes. business. What were some of the challenges that you had starting your own business? So initially, I decided to drop down my human hours from five days a week to three days a week. And those two days a week that I wasn't working with humans, I went around as a mobile service before I had orthopause. I was called Unleashed Mobility. Um, but I went around and I helped people like when the vets would call me in and I'm like, this is awesome. Like I didn't really have any overhead costs. I'm like, this is great. Um, and eventually it got so busy that I needed the business and I'm like, this is great. This is going to be easy, but there are so many uphill battles with this. Um, one of them being people don't know it's an option Two being, it's hard to show people things if they don't give it a chance. Um, and three, like, how do you get this? It's one of those things like human prosthetics and orthotics is that you don't need it until you need it. Um, it's not like I'm going to go research this and I don't even have a dog, but I'm going to know about this. Like it, it's, yeah. Yeah. you have to know about it. Um, and it's a very niche market. So once the vets are learning about it, that makes it easier for us. It builds some trust. But like, if we have a huge billboard on the street of a busy highway, maybe one in 10,000 people would be like, ah, I need that. Um, so it's, there's some uphill battles, but as people are coming in, we're finding our flow. The vets are trusting us. They're telling their other vets. Um, so many roadblocks, but it just takes a little traction and we're finally getting that. Traction. That's good. That's good. Good word yeah. to use with this. You know, I read a quote from you in that great article that you had, and I want to read it to you and ask you a question about it. You said, I started looking for options and realized there is a lot of junk out there and companies prey on people who don't know the difference between good and bad. Yeah. Is there more bad prosthetics out there in general, uh, especially in the animal world, than there are good, or is it just the lack of knowledge for what you need, mm -hmm. what they need? need? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so there are many brands that do this exclusively and they do custom products. And even some of those, I'm not going to name any names, even some of those are not very good. Um, but especially if you just go online and you order a small, medium, large kind of thing, there is no way that that is going to help your animal. Even if you have the best of intentions, it's one, if you don't know what it's supposed to do, how can you tell if it's working? Wow. Yeah. Like it for, I'm going to go back to knee brace because it's the most common thing. And if you go on Amazon and type in dog knee brace, you'll see thousands of these little fabric options that kind of strap over and have some of the fancy ones have like a little metal hinge on the side. 
But like, that's not what we're addressing with the brace. That's not what the brace is supposed to do. Um, so when you go online, unless you know what makes something good and bad, you're probably going to buy something that's cheaper. You know, like, why would I buy a $1,200 brace when I could buy a $50 brace? Yes. Um, you'll also go online, like if your dog has a wrist or an ankle injury, and you'll see, again, these little fabric devices, or even ones with a metal hinge. But if you don't know how they work and what it's supposed to do, you're probably wasting your money and you're probably making it worse. Um, and the way to learn about what's good and bad is one, to see good options, to see the before and the afters and how they're working and what they have in common. Um, but two, like read the reviews. If you're putting them on the dog and they're walking the exact same and the only difference is they're getting boo-boos, it's probably not a good device. And I say this to say that a lot of vets even completely discount braces because of these experiences. Vets will be interested at some point in their career, not all of them. But a lot of them will have a client, they're like, I wonder if a brace would work for this. So they go online and they choose the thing that looks the coolest and it doesn't work. And then they've sworn off braces entirely. Um, it's wow. not in their wheelhouse. It's something that they, you know, they don't learn about it at all. Um, like vet med is probably 50, 60, 100 years <laughs> behind human medicine for this kind of product. So like, the vets that usually learn about this are usually in the rehab space. Um, the other ones, since there are probably one to a hundred of rehab to regular vets, one of our challenges is saying, hey, like, I know that you have tried a brace before. Did it happen to be a brace from Amazon or a $20 little sleeve from XYZ website? And they're like, yeah, it was, but it didn't work well. So like, we're just going to do surgery or in animal world, if they don't know what to do, they put the animal down. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. And it breaks my heart um, because I literally had a client two weeks ago. Their vet was very against bracing because of some bad experience. I don't know what the experience was, but they were told to put the dog down because they couldn't go through surgery. So we made him braces and he could stand up straight and he could be a dog. Um, so, you know, a lot of what we do is bracing. Um, we do do prostheses as well. That's less common. And those are a little bit more like you can see the result because now they have a leg and they didn't. Um, but we do the full scope here. So it just there's a lot of misinformation out there and not a lot of studies like there are for humans saying this works because of X, Y, Z. It's really they're preying on the emotions of people. Like yeah. no, no one wants to see their dog hurt yeah. ever. And anyone will do whatever they can in their means to help. Like that man we talked about all the stuff off Amazon, trying to cast themselves. It, you know, the best of intentions don't solve the problem. You have to have someone that does this to help you solve the problem. Um, Absolutely. So I, bringing it home and talking about putting it down. Yeah. I, that's, I honestly wasn't thinking that way. Um, but Sorry. I <laughs> No, no, I, but it's, it's something that I think needs to come up because it's a shame that people may come to that conclusion when what you do and your knowledge can prevent that. So yeah, great. So that we're you're doing trying that. to start the process of creating like educational units for vets so that we can go in and, you know, all the vets love lunch and learns because they get free food. Um, <laughs> but like, if we can educate them, be like, at this point, send us a client like don't wait till it's here if they can't do surgery send them to us like we are not trying to compete with the vets we are trying to be a partner much like in human medicine where the doctor is not trying to create your prosthetic arm or leg like they are sending you to someone that does that yeah that is what orthopause is um, so how did we talked about humans or, or the pet owners getting in touch with you if you is that the same process if a vet is listening to this and they want to work with you, what would be the proper channels for them to get a hold of you? Good question. Um, hi, vets, if you're listening, please send me patients. Um, <laughs> but on our website, we have um, a for veterinarians section. And on there, there's a little bit more technical information, but there's also our referral form. Um, we try to be very careful since I'm not a vet. I don't try to be a vet. I don't try to diagnose anything. I try to stay very far away from that for many reasons. I rely on the vet's diagnosis. On that page, we have a little bit more information about common conditions, 
general price ranges, expectations, because in actuality, like we're here and we would love to do all the emails and leads online and phone calls, but a lot of our people are coming from vets. Um, and it essentially becomes the vet's duty to teach people enough about these to have them reach out to us. Yeah. Um, so on that page, there's enough basic information about like, like I said, about pricing, procedure, commonly treated conditions, so that they can go on there, they can fill out the referral form, which says, this is the patient, I am the vet. I don't know, what, like they can put, I don't know what they need, but the diagnosis is degenerative myelopathy. They can just put that. And then on there, we have goals because we need to be realistic. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we want to be optimistic, but we need to be realistic. We are not magic. So on there, we have the goals and then they sign it. That way it is just like human land. When we get a referral, we're doing it for doctor's orders. Um, and working off of that. So on that page on the website, they can send us direct referrals. Um, they can also email us or call us if they have questions. Um, we have a couple of vets that will say, hey, Danny, I have someone coming in this date at this time. Can you FaceTime in? Yeah, absolutely. That's excellent. I want to remind everyone we're talking about the website. I'm talking to Danielle Robbins, and you can find her on orthopause.vet. So in case you're just listening and, and not looking at the description, you got to know how to get a hold of this great <laughs> company. And when I talk about the great company, what are you looking to do in the future? What's the future look like if, if you think about like a year out, five years out, some of the things you're looking to do with your business? Yeah, um, we're fairly unique in the fact that we only right now, it's just our location in Florida. But as we expand and we plan to ideally within the next few years, have one of these in at least every other state. Um, because we, we have people from all over come to us. Like I have people from mid Georgia drive down to us in Tampa, you know, like make seven, eight hours trips each way, which I appreciate, but like, we'd like to make it more accessible to people. Um, so plans for our future. We'd like to have more of these. I will be training more CPOs to learn about the animal side, because even in the master's program, we had one person come for two hours and show us like, hey, you can do a brace for a dog and you can cast a dog and see you later. Um, there's there's not a lot of information out there um, at all. So we, we'd like to change that, like not just for like our benefit, but for anyone that's watching their dog struggle to get around, like they need answers and they need help. Um, so we'd like orthopause to be the hanger clinic of like the animal world. like. When people think of orthotics and prosthetics, whether that's your experience or not, most people know what hanger is. We'd like for orthopods to be like, oh, my dog needs something, let's go to the dog version um, or the cat version, whatever. Um, but that's kind of the plan for orthopods. We're starting nice and small and condensed. We're working with people from all over Florida. Um, even we just had the huge Hurricane Helene come through and I still have someone coming today. To the, to the client, yeah, to see us um, for a fitting of a wheelchair. So we want to be everywhere, the short answer. Um, Nothing wrong with that, I think, because yeah. what you're doing is so important. And you said also you're learning 3D printing. Yes. Um, one of the goals that we have since currently we're just using the brands that I know and that I trust and choosing between them based on the client, they're all great. However, the turnaround times are an issue. Um, it's usually a couple weeks, some of them a little bit more, depending on what's going on. And it's hard to watch your animal do that. And just having been and being a human CPO, it's funny to say that, but a human CPO, like I, I see the good and the bad in all of these brands. Um, and since most of these companies, like their designs are valid, but it's been the same for 40 years, I think there's a big opportunity to bring a professional that can 3D print proper designs um, and distribute them on a case per case basis. So that's what we'd like to do. I'm still learning, um, but hopefully by next year, patient doesn't have to drive all the way up to Palm Harbor. I can teach their vet, they can scan in the mold, I can make it and ship it to them. Um, so kind of a hybrid model of what's happening right now with the vets, but we'd really, we want to be more involved than other manufacturers because that's going to yield the best results. That's one of the things when I think of my own journey, I, I think I told you earlier, I wore a prosthetic back in the day mm -hmm. and then I saw what was available nowadays when I hadn't looked in years. And it's just amazing uh, yeah. the things that are available for not only humans, but 
3D printing has really changed the, the game, hasn't it, for prosthetics? Yeah. Um, sorry, are you talking about humans or animals now? Either one. Yeah. Um, so in, in my human job, um, we're 3D printing our test sockets, which cuts down on the um, turnaround time quite a bit. So traditionally, um, animal prostheses were made out of like a thermoformed plastic, kind of like a test socket or a human land, temporary stuff. Um, but for animals, like there's nothing to hold on to. Like there's for a human if they're missing a full limb. So we have to do a body jacket. Um, and typically those were made out of those thermoformed plastics. So they're not very flexible. They're very rigid. So like breathing, which is important sometimes, you know, um, could be an issue. Like if they get really hot and they're breathing a lot and the device isn't flexing, it's going to lead to sores. Like it's going to cause a lot of harm. Um, but we work with this company called 3D Pets and they... Wow. 3D print all they do. They don't do braces wow. or anything, at least not yet. But like their properties, like this is a TPU harness and a 3D printed foot that's really like, it's got a lot of bounce to it. So it's light, they can breathe in it. You could run over this thing with a car and it would be fine. Don't do that. But you could run over it with a car and it would not break, it would be fine. Um, so they're, they're a great company, um, but the, the braces aren't like that. The braces are pretty old school, and even though they work really well, they have been the same for a long time, kind of like what you're saying now. Um, so there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but I just think that it could be done more efficiently, with less waste, faster. Like, I have a thousand square foot office here, and in the back, I have everything I need to make a brace. I have the printer, I have velcro i have supplies like i can do it all right here instead of having a humongous lab and i could in reality once i'm more fluent in this um print something and have it done next day for someone wow. instead of waiting three weeks five weeks you know so there's there's a large gap for improvement and all these companies are coming at it from the same point of mind of trying to help clients but they are so established that it's very hard for them to change how they're doing things. Meanwhile, we have just seen the good and bads of all sides, and we're trying to make that marriage of convenient, affordable, and correct. Um, so, yeah, there's it should be good. We have some trial and error to do. We're going to print them and try it on clients, and then once we get it just right, then we'll offer it. But um, that's in the works so that, again, when there's more of these, someone can come in, maybe spend a night in a hotel if they're coming from a bar and get it the next day instead of seven hours up for the casting and molding, drive back to wherever you were, come back in two to three weeks, you know, um, for everyone's sake. So yeah, that's something that we're working on. Um, maybe we'll 3d print our sign later on. I don't know, but, um, <laughs> that's something we're trying to do. Well, I have a layman question because yeah. some, as I, as I think this through, I think of, let, let's say a lower limb amputee and what they sure. need, the prosthetic has to hold uh, the whole weight of the body and yeah. basically on two legs, half the weight of the body where on a huge, on a animal, generally speaking, they're, they're going to weigh a little bit less depending on the animal you're, you're mm -hmm. helping with the prosthetic. So does that help with the 3d printing too, where there's more challenges on a human, but maybe because of the weight, the weight distribution and things like that. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And when I got into this, I'm like, yeah, it'll be easier. Cause I was thinking like that. It's actually sort of the opposite. Interesting. Um, humans are straight up and down for the most part. So like if I'm making a prosthesis, I know as a prosthetist that I need to align it like this. I need hmm. to choose this style foot. I know that they're going to be walking forward and their knee is going to be in X alignment with like a very little bit of deviation between people generally. Yeah. For animals, if you look at a shepherd with their hips, knees, ankles, they're, they're very bendy and they're very bendy in more than one plane. So if you're doing a front leg, dogs carry most of their weight on their front legs. So for those, it's a little easier because it's mostly straight. But when you get to the hind limbs, like you're doing a, an ankle slash hock brace or a stifle for the knee, those angles are completely different. So for their prosthetics, the alignment is actually much more difficult um, because it's not like human land where it's up and down. It would be much easier if it was, but it, it's not. Um, so for full limb, front limb amputees for animals, we use a device like this where 
again, it's just straight up and down. It's 3D printed. Yeah. The goal of that is not to bend like a leg, which is something I have to explain to people because in humans, if it doesn't bend like your leg, you're like, what is this? Like, no. Um, but for animals, it's really just to prevent those compensatory injuries in the front. When they're missing a hind limb, though, that is that is a very tricky thing because of those angles. Um, so for animals, it's actually, for me, actually, it's a little bit harder because human, they're missing left, right, below knee, above knee. We're trained in all those things, and it's pretty similar across most humans. For animals, there is no normal. Um, so again, that's another thing that goes into this, making it good or bad. What are you basing it off on? Experience, outcomes, results. And you have to have a trained person to look for that. Otherwise, it's like the one of the scary things about the animal realm of this is that there's no particular certification or license required to do this at all, which is very scary to me. Um, like, I could have someone in their basement 3D print a leg and sell it the same way that I'm trying to do. Meanwhile, I have a degree in this, have been specially trained, et cetera. So it's, it's really important to know who you're working with and make sure that they understand. Because in humans, you have to be licensed, which is a good thing. In animals, it's, it's not there yet. I'm really glad I asked that question because it really kind of encapsulated the whole, the whole issue of just getting on Amazon and trying to yeah. diagnose your dog because my assumptions were not correct so thank you for that 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 yeah and, and honestly thank you for everything you do i mean I, I, as i said as we started you know a person gets into the prosthetic field uh, and maybe they don't have any limb loss uh, experience or members mm -hmm. of the family and they still get into it and they still help the community and that's what you're doing and you're not only doing it for humans because you said that uh, us uh, pesky humans you still dabble with it. <laughs> <laughs> you still dabble with but you're doing it for the dogs and i i just mm -hmm. can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your day for to being on the podcast i i'm I, happy to i i want to get an update you know maybe in a year you can come back on or six months whenever you'd like because yeah. i'd like to know how things are going I, I i see great things in the future for what you do i like the passion like i said in your voice and thanks thank you for everything you're doing and thank you for being a guest today on the We're Not Stone Thank podcast. you so much for having me. I appreciate it. That was the We're Not Stump podcast, hosted by Mike Bowling. If you want to be a guest on the program, reach out to Mike at his email address, mike at mikebowling.com. This podcast is produced by One Hand Man Productions. If you are looking to start your podcast, go to onehandmanproductions.com.